All right, guys. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Um, so thank you and um, welcome. I'm Tracy. I'm the marketing manager here at Amplify, and um, you are joining us today for um, a webinar centered around the topic of upgrading the Interworks platform. As you know, when you registered for this webinar, we had an input field for you to add or ask any questions that you had around this topic. Just know that you do have the option to submit questions during the webinar as well. At the bottom of the screen, there's a button that says Q&A and you can submit your questions through there. Um, this session, like all others, are is recorded and we host it on our website. We also send out an email at the end of the session, probably about two days later, that will include the link to the recording so you can watch it at your leisure or share it internally inside of your company. Um, so that's literally about how it goes with these webinars. And let's take a moment to get to know the experts that are joining us today. Um, we're joined today by Daniel O'Keen. He is responsible for Interworks product portfolio at Windshuttle. He drives the technical priorities and deliveries through engagement with key stakeholders in developing roadmap, product roadmap and plan for releases from concept through product launch. Also, we're joined by Nandor Forgash. He's recently joined Amplify as a solutions consultant. He came to us after providing eight years of service in food manufacturing where he held a variety of roles. Most recently as the product owner and master data steward in the United States and Canada product data. During his time as a master data steward, he was responsible for managing Interworks and setting the strategic direction for the team. And lastly, but definitely not least, I like to aptly call him the grand pooba of him. You like that, Eric? <laughs> um, <laughs> it works. <laughs> Eric is the practice director here at Amplify for Interworks. He has nearly 10 years of experience working directly with Interworks platform for multiple clients. He has experience helping clients reach their full potential within the platform. So we're talking today about upgrades and patches. So who can tell me the difference between each of these for Interworks? I guess I will, I will have to <clears throat> take that up uh, since I'm the Entoys guy, the main Entoys guy here. So, so basically, I think the way we define our releases is not much different from most typical software companies. So we have uh, major, minor releases and maintenance, which most some people call patches. We call it maintenance. So from our perspective, I think uh, a major release will introduce new features but typically they will come with very significant either architectural changes or huge features, maybe a whole new add-on or a new change of things. So there, there's a lot of, so typically when we do major releases, most, most likely that when you upgrade, there might be some things to take into consideration when you're doing that. So, uh, so that, that will be a major release. So either a big architectural change or huge features, right? Like something new or we're changing the look and feel, the overall UI, something major, right? So as, as the name implies. And then for minor releases, uh, it will typically be new features as well. They could be big features, depending on, but typically there will not be much uh, architectural changes. So basically you could, you should be able to deploy most of our minor releases on the existing infrastructure. Uh, as it goes. But for major releases, most likely you will have to consider, look at uh, your existing infrastructure. And, and I'll, I'll talk about examples from uh, that we've gone through from maybe version eight, nine, and 10. I'll come to talk about that. So, uh, and in terms of uh, the availability of it, so typically it's available, or uh, we have one hub, so it's available for customers through their partners or through our PS team. To install so it's just there so when you are ready based on your needs it's available for you to install whether it's major or minor and for maintenance releases uh currently we are on a good cadence so i feel so good about it that i could talk about it if you talk to me about maybe five six months ago i would say it's still in the flux but now i know we've got a good cadence so i could confidently say that there are releases that we release every four to six weeks that's very very we are 
on, on schedule. To, we always deliver on that. But they will typically be addressing specific customer needs, issues that impact uh, customer ability to use our product in a critical way. Maybe it's impacting them business, uh, critical to business issues that affect. We, we tend to try to produce uh, maintenance releases for those. So when we do, unlike the uh, major or minor releases, we tend to, it's available because it affects specific users. So we make it available, but uh, you have to, if you if you are not one of those customers with those issues, but maybe if, if it's impacting you, support will reach out to you for sure. If you ask for those, if you report those type of issues, but otherwise, if you are just curious and you just want to, be on the latest, all you have to do is just to make a request uh, to support and they will make it available to your service, pro your providers or peers to uh, to get it on your system. And and typically for uh, maintenance releases, it should be it's more, less cost, less consideration as maybe uh, when, when when people are deploying, they need, they, there's not less things to consider. So it's cheaper in terms of uh, consequences for installing those. So uh, uh, that's the way it is. And then in, in terms of talking, so, and how frequent do we release? So now in terms of minor and major releases, we've not got good cadence yet because we've been mixing them up. We've not had a maybe 10, we had 10 version 10 release a while ago. Typically we should have had maybe version 11, right? But for historical reasons, which I'll get into, most of our new feature releases, we've been releasing them on minor releases. So, so I'll say that major and minor releases together, we typically target to release one or two per year, depending on the size or complexity of work, right? So that, that, that's our current plan. Now, uh, in terms of the major minor releases, there are, there are some architectural changes for looking at, now let's look at specifically the history of Entoworks, what we've done. I mean, I'll go as far back as maybe version eight, nine and 10. So for example, version eight, which was a major release, the architecture is very different from uh, version nine and 10. I mean, with, with version eight, I mean, it's very simple. You have two main servers, an app server and web server, and probably your DB server, and it's fixed. That's what you do. And, and, and components have to be installed there. So you've got a controller, JBoss controller on your app server, and you've got a web server on each and then you put EPX on one of them and that's it. So it's very simple. So if somebody, if you're a customer, you're on eight and you're moving to nine, there was a huge architectural change. So we moved to very highly distributed architecture, right? So I must say that version nine, I'll describe it as, I wasn't here when it was shipped, but obviously I have to go back and look at the history if I'm gonna be a good steward of product management to you guys. So uh, it looks like version nine, it, it, was, it was, I was call it transitional, transitional release for us in the sense that very few people were able to release it. And the history is that I mean, it was very huge change to go to distributed environment and you know the complexity that comes with it. So there were some few issues we need to deal with, uh, but uh, we dealt with it and then that's why we turned around and released version 10. So version 10 is basically architectural wise is similar to version nine, but we focused on fixing the stability of the product. So we make it more stable. So that's why we've not released version 11 now because we focused on making it very stable. And, and that coincided with around uh, wind shadow buying us as well. So even the need to focus on stability and the code quality became more important. We got more resources for QA and to do more things. So with respect to uh, version eight, it's very simple. So you have web server, app server, DB, but with version nine and 10, as I said, it's very distributed. And what that means is that we introduce more components, we have microservices, and then we have the new UI. So the previous classic UI uses a JSP, Java uh, client. The uh, new UI, 2020 UI is more Angular-based UI, right? So unfortunately, as you guys know or not, you are, you are using both as we talk, because uh, maybe most of the operational use cases are fully baked into the new UI, but not the admin pages. We have plans for that. We could talk about that if we need to. But the key thing is that we have the Go server, which deals with microservices, and then you have the Rabbit MQ. So now it's based on it's queue, message queue based. So what that means is that it gives us 
very flexible architecture to scale out, right? So for example, all the services, unlike the eight with nine, all the services that you have running, you could literally pull each service and pull it on the separate server to scale out, to have scale and expand. So for example, minimum maybe by four, instead of having three servers, which is fixed, if you ask, if you were to talk to maybe someone like Eric or some of our professional services guy that, hey, how many servers do I need to deploy version 10, that the current end towards, they'll say, it depends. Let me look at your needs, right? What do you need? How all the speed, what the scale, what machines? And they could scale out. If you, they could bring it more. If you need, if you if you your your capacity is bigger, they could they could they could pull out different services and scale them out, right? So we are, that gives us flexibility to do that. Of course, doing that means it's very complex to make sure they work together. That's why version nine ended up being a transitionary release for us, and then we focus on uh, maybe making it better release in the uh, in version 10. And then so uh, in version 10, and then the same infrastructure, but we added, we had already had uh, AWS S3, we added Azure support as well in version 10. So that's the only new thing. So that's more additional rather than trans, uh, very huge architectural change, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think in terms of the difference architecturally, that's where it is. I don't know, Eric, do you want to jump in or you want to talk about maybe the features that covers each of those yeah. things? So. And I, and I think how you're talking about the different versions of the software and, and the reason behind the changes and the updates to the software is truly for features and functionality, right? And it, and it comes out of business requirements and business use cases from the clients. So one of the transitions we saw is, again, as Daniel pointed out in the older version, seven and eight uh, is very simple design as far as the server layouts. We didn't have an extended microservices layer. And the microservices layer allows us to use RabbitMQ as a messaging service. And one of the requests that's come for the majority of our clients over time is instead of doing simple flat file translate transmissions between systems, we want to be able to make use of the APIs. We want to be able to make use of the message queue system to get more of a real time feel on all of the all of our updates within the system. Uh, because obviously, data has become very important. We need to translate that data and send it in real time or as close to real time as we can. And so by creating that microservices layer and having that available and having the message queue component with RabbitMQ available, now you can connect other services via the microservices layer. And it becomes very easy to do that in the architecture with the, the design in nine and 10, um, more specifically in 10, because that has the additional functionality that, that Daniel mentioned. So that's kind of the reasoning behind all of these processes is that you know, we do the upgrades and we move into the new version to apply new functionality and then also to create the ability for teams to be able to manage that data and, and do, you know, stay up with the tech, with technology in that sense as well, right? And move towards the, the API approach yeah. rather than a traditional flat file approach. Yeah. yeah. And also, I mean, especially when it comes to different versions, especially, I think, you remember that uh, Wind Shadow took over, but uh, acquired end to work. So what that means is the English shuttle is bigger, so we in, we have to apply more. That's when I came in, and my job was to make sure we are we are, we are predictable in what we ship, and more very more, uh, uh, you know what's coming. We have a cadence, and hopefully I've done some. You guys see some difference. If you don't, then maybe I've not done my job well. But I think uh, we get in that cadence. So for example, from version ten, which is a state very stable, very, very stable version of uh, that new architecture. We, we have got good cadence. So currently, if you were to go to the release notes, if someone comes to me, I'll just point you to our public website. And in each release note from, I think, from 10 to going, it's very clear what new features are in there, right? So uh, it's very, very clear. So some of them, so for example, you go in there, version two, I mean, and this is on our help.windshadow.com. You go to uh, Enterworks, you see it right there. So version uh, 10.2, uh, we had fewer features, but it's, it's focused on st stabilization, making sure that product is predictable to remove all the pain that you guys have been facing. And we did that very successfully in terms of, uh, for example, shared config files, making sure it's now consolidated in the database rather than being all over the place you go to. Hopefully you go to one place to do it. We still have some remnants of things hanging around, but most of it, you go into a database one place to do it as well. And then uh, I don't know. I mean, do we, Eric, do you want to talk about maybe we should talk about the new features that comes in or want to move to? Yeah, we, we could uh, kind of delve into that. And I think before okay. we get to that, the, the key to think of, to keep in mind here is that the new features are really driven by 
our clients, right? Um, that's, that's a good portion of it. So um, one of the things that, that typically we see is the, the tick within the ticketing system uh, within Windshuttle, you can request an enhancement within that ticketing system. And then what we've seen is typically within you know three months, six months, whatever time frame, based upon the you know the request and the the level of effort to put that into the tool and the number of requests for that particular function, you start to see those features slowly you know, added to the, the core product as it goes through. So what that does, that helps the entire community, right? Because then everyone using the tool has the ability to have access to these new features and functionality, and you can continue to suggest those. And so you're improving the actual Wind Shuttle and Works tool itself, and you're also kind of helping the rest of, of the client base to, to, you know, move forward as well. So I, I think there's a few examples we recently did, right? With like 10.3, for example, can you kind of go over a couple of the, the upgrade components there? Yeah, that's a good point. So whilst we're doing that, we try to, as Eric said, so we want to deliver new things that you need whilst we are balancing that, especially having come from nine and then trying to balance in terms of stability and making sure things that we need to change, like UI, moving to UI. We, we try to get good balance. I would have liked to spend a lot more time to add way new things, right? So for from 10.3 going, which we call Aristotle, one of the biggest things is around two things. So the API enhancement, we did some multi-repository API, which is huge in terms of uh, performance and being able to just make one call to actually make a transaction across multiple repositories. You pull the attributes you need into one and make one call. Uh, those of you who have used our APIs previously, you know that if you have 15 repositories and you want to just pull one attribute out of it, you make you have to make 15 calls, right, for each of them. And you can imagine managing them, pulling them together, and just pre-processing, aggregating, de-aggregating, all that, uh, deduplication, de all that stuff, right? So, so that's very important. And it was driven by the need in the field. And then also for our Smart Template Pro capability, when we started doing that, we realized that, uh, well, we need to make one call for multiple repositories, right? So, and, and so like killing two beds with one stone. So we did that. So Smart Template Pro is one of the new stuff. So obviously the need has been identified before I came, right? So I was responsible for making sure we delivered it. And then uh, whilst we do that, and also we did things around Azure for Azure houses that we make sure the key components around DAM support and then SSO, we delivered those capabilities as well. Now, one area that, uh, it's coming up a lot. Uh, it's around uh, match and measure fusion component. Some people call it infolink, but it's fusion. That's match and measure. That's generally it's about ETL. Uh, now that we have, have a lot of work to do to make it look as part of the product in terms of UI and other stuff. But we realize that we we are we be very very responsive, agile in delivering solutions for us, and we do still have some work to in terms of training and enablement and stuff. But the way it is now, uh, when when the need comes, the customer needs it, we do step up to make sure they keep moving. We want to make sure our customers keep moving forward whilst we build all the infrastructure and the processes in place. And uh, there's a lot of work going on in that. So those are for 10.3, those are the key main deliverables that we delivered now. Of course, we are working on, 10, we ship 10.4, which is just focused on UK local and mainly uh, Windshadow have very strong presence in Europe. Would have liked to do the local for everybody, but we got some, I think there was a lot of demand from UK. So, and obviously this is a pivot we did because we have a lot of work we do for Homer, which was originally term for, and mainly around like our sales portal, uh, then our fitment rules, quite a few match and merge, uh, improved search before create. That's like real time in session to match and merge. There are a lot of things which are coming in the pike as well, but th those are some of the uh, features. And if you need smart template pro, Obviously, that means you have to upgrade, right? You have to move to 10.3 uh, in order to take advantage of uh, capability like that. And, and that kind of ties back to our architecture discussion too, right? Because if you were on the older architecture of Enable 8, uh, you don't have the same design as the Anaworks 10 platform. So in order to take advantage of all those new features like match and merge, uh, and all and all of those things you discussed, you have to move to that new framework as well. So there are some technical changes that need to happen within the architecture to support that, right? And that's the reason for kind of moving forward with the versions and staying and keeping you up to date on a version. 
that doesn't mean you necessarily have to be on the latest patch version, right? Or uh, uh, so you don't necessarily have to take 10.4 tomorrow. You could be on 10.3 or 10.2 or 10.1, but I think the key is to try and get to at least the latest version of the software at, at a bare minimum because of the architecture changes, right? To take advantage of some of those functions. Exactly, yeah. And another thing I should have mentioned when, we were, when I was explaining the difference between maintenance, minor, major release. So for our maintenance releases, the policy we have is that, uh, for example, I could use 10.4. We just shipped 10.4 recently, right? Now, most of you, those who are on the latest, they are on 10.3x, right? So, of course, we're going to, the next uh, maintenance release coming up has to be on 10.3x. So it will be 10.3.6 because nobody's moved on 10.4. But once, maybe in that month, two months, when customers start moving to 10.4 for whatever reason, when we shift to producing patches on uh, ten, uh, uh, maintenance releases on 10.4, we're not going to be going back to 10.2, 10.3 unless it's critical to the customer business and there's a business reason they could upgrade. But that will be a one off type of thing. But otherwise, the uh, maintenance releases is always on the latest uh, releases, latest major or minor release that are most prevalent out there. So, so I think mean, that kind of leads us into why you'd want to upgrade, right? Uh, so the most obvious one is to stay up to date with all the uh, form and features and functions of the tool and to be able to do that. But what are some of the other reasons you might um, want to take a maintenance upgrade or move to a new version across? Do you have some ideas on that, Daniel? I think I, think I, I expect Nando to do, Nando has been on the field, he's been doing this for a while, so maybe it's better to come from the horse's own mouth than me, yeah, the true. product guy, talking about that. I've never <laughs> deployed a customer stuff before. So. So, so Nando just went through this on the client side. Yeah. Like you yeah. were working for a company and that, that uses the Anaworks tool, and um, and you guys just went through the whole upgrade process. So kind of walk us through what you did and and you know the thought process behind it before you upgraded and sort of sort of the you know end to end on that. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's interesting uh, listening to Daniel earlier talk about, uh, you know, the, the versions 9 to 10 and that upgrade patch that was in there, because we were actually, I think, one of the few customers that were using 9 at the time. And, and we went to upgrade to 10 specifically to have that stability that that the upgrade and the patch is offered for, for version 10. Um, so having that stable environment so then we could really let the system burn in with all the uh, additions that we made using the APIs and, and the syndication channels that we had built out so we could let that burn in and make sure everything was working properly without having to worry about uh, system stability. So system stability was huge um, for us, for our reasoning to make make that uh, that upgrade. And to be honest, I think it's something that we probably should have addressed sooner than later. And I think we sat on it a little bit too long, but that's always a, a major question that comes up within that side of the world is, you know, when is the right time? Because it is um, a little bit of a sticky point because it, it kind of throws a wrench into your plans with everything else because your system's essentially shut down for probably a good month for you to run through and run that upgrade through your test systems and then into your production system and, and do all the testing that you need. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of things that kind of go along with that too, because, you know, you typically yeah. have to plan the release, right? So, right. Uh, you know, because, and it works is not going to be the only tool in, in the tool shed, right? Within the right, right. organization. So there's ERP to consider. Mm -hmm. There are e-commerce engines to consider. There's BI tools to consider. And of course, those play in that space, right? Because we might be syndicating to a BI tool. We might be syndicating to an e-commerce website. Uh, we may be syndicating back to the ERP for new, new item creation, you know, if that's part of your new item setup workflow. And so as you think about upgrading, what were some of the things you have to consider there that you noticed under when you were when you're getting ready to go from like nine to 10? Um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, to your point, Erica, a lot of it was the connections, um, making sure that the connections and the data flow coming over um, were working correctly as you went through the schedule. So the API guy calls were still functioning the way they were. And if there were any changes that needed to be made, they were addressed as well, um, as well as internal um, things that we were doing within Enterworks uh, from syndication jobs and scheduled jobs and uh, transformational work for GDSN syndication. So ensuring that all those were functioning properly the way that we needed them to do when we made the upgrades. Um, I, yeah, and I mean, it, it's all, every company is different. Um, 
with us, we, we had a, one of those sticky points that we always had was making sure that the repositories always went from staging to production uh, together. And that was something that was key for us because all the data worked together as a bundle rather than independently. So um, if something was missing in one of the repositories and it was key, then there was nothing went. Uh, you can send um, bits and pieces of the data. So, um, you know, it, it, there are there were a lot of different aspects that that went into making sure, you know, we we checked off our boxes before and then after in the testing phases once the uh, patches were implemented to ensure that all basic and um, important functionality was working from from API to syndication to the internal uh, um, uh, schedule of jobs and then and then also the transformational jobs that we had running. And it sounds like you're kind of speaking a little bit about package promotions, which was another function that, that was added. Yeah, as the, as that was a life changer. Across time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so you, I mean, it, it was a business use case that turns into right. a core a core product component right. that you can then use. And, and then with 10, um, there were some additions to that whole process that made right. it a little bit easier to work with um, and to be able to manage. So uh, so I think, you know, that's important. You have to do a lot of the testing side of it. The other piece to kind of keep in mind is you do have to plan for it with your IT department because, uh, you know, as business friendly as the tool is, right, you can do a lot of work within the tool and you can make a lot of changes and, and move that data around and send it downstream and do all those things. But there are certain elements that do require uh, more of an IT development lens right so one of the things i think you need to plan for and, and as a company is okay if, if i know that i'm allowed uh you know q2 within a two-month radius to be able to do any deployments that i'm going to do for this particular uh piece of software across the board you know it could be your erp system it could be your e-commerce engine it could be whatever it is it's it's important to get that in front of the it group and have them understand because remember we as, as much as we try not to work in silos there's still that separation of IT, marketing, you know, product group, all of those kinds of groups, as much as they work together collaboratively these days, there are still elements where, you know, you may not know that there's a major upgrade happening to the ERP system this year. Um, so, so a key is to get out in front of it as quickly as possible. Um, check the, the notes the, that are on the wind shuttle site. You know, Daniel had mentioned that each time there's a new um, maintenance release or a new major release, there's a huge list of all of the functions and forms that were added, um, all of the changes that were made and, and any known issues that still may, may be in, in process, right? That are being worked on for a future maintenance release. So if you see those things and you can look through them, you can provide that to the IT group and say, hey, we have a business need. It's on this list, it's in this. This is a really key target for us. Can we scope this out for a um, May, June um, upgrade, right? And handle in that sense so that you're not behind in the process and you're not kind of knocking on IT's door at the last minute trying to get them to do things because typically most most IT teams work in an, an agile fashion, right? So they plan everything out in sprints and things are planned out months and months and months in advance. So if you try to go to them in April and ask for something you need in May, it's probably not going to happen. But if you look at the, the upgrade that we know is coming because you've checked the wind shuttle site, you know that, you know, 10.4 is to be released in, you know, July uh, then you could look at that and say, okay, I know this is coming in July. I'm going to talk with them when I find out about it and we're going to deploy it in August, September, right? So we have the time to plan for it. So that's that's another key, I think, for success is being able to bridge that gap between the business operations group, which is the one that's typically using and owning the BIM system and the IT group that does have to still support the tool in some sense. Um, Daniel, have you seen anything along those lines or could you add to that? Yeah, so from, from my perspective, I think uh, if I look at it from a product, the key reasons, so for example, if, uh, I know a, a key case, I, I could talk about some example is uh, unite, uh, unified parent-child view, right? So mm -hmm. that that view now, that's something, it's, it's not like it's part of the UI to just be able to show your, if you've got a link relationship, the way previously, if you want to show, see, visualize the data, you need to just Go look at the parent data, then go and click a link and then bring the link relationship data. Now, of course, one of our key customers who was on, I think, eight or nine, they needed to see, they have this use case for their vendors, large number of vendors, or I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of vendors who will see this view. They wanted them to be able to see their parent data by uh, and the 
child data side by side because they need to make a decision on that. Now, just what done with when I decided to do it. Now, the key thing is that I'm not gonna go and put that type of change in an old release, right? So that that alone was a big enough feature. All they, they would have considered stay on the old release and push us because they are strategic. They would have been pushing us to keep producing patches for them. But that feature, I said, no, it's gonna go because it requires to be on a new platform. So they have to move to the new platform. So that alone triggered them. So that was a good reason for them to upgrade, right? To plan. So they said, okay, when are we gonna release it? They planned and have that to do type, that type of upgrade based on, they made the upgrade decision. There are other things as well, but that triggered their decision. Right. The, the need that. for that yes. uh, deployment. Yeah. I, I might have missed it, but whenever you know that an upgrade is coming, do you know every feature or fix that should be in that upgrade? Uh, yes. And, and was that, we mentioned that. So, so first, we used to have a lot of defects issue, but now the release notes, which is available online, is publicly available. You can go there and check what releases are there and all the list of customer facing issues that we're addressing there. Every ticket, customer ticket, we mm-hmm. specify the Zendesk ID and then the Jira ID that was fixed with it. So if you're a customer, you have reported an issue, a, a ticket, you have the ticket number, you can just go and search for it and you'll know mm-hmm. if your fix is in there or not. Okay, so you know like prior to the release, whether or not okay. your fix is coming? And that's a good question. So currently what we're doing, we're doing that with our partners. So we let we have, as part of our partner enablement, we have a meeting, uh, which we started this release. So we just, we make sure they have access to the draft, right? Because remember when we're fixing issues, it's an ongoing thing. So maybe last right. minute we could have some blocker that we need to delay the release. So based on that, we've, we've, we've committed to provide access to, the, uh, to our, our partners earlier so that when they are working with customers, they could be able they'll be empowered to have the right conversation with their, uh, their customer that, okay, this year of defect is in or not. So, but if a customer uh, really is not working with a partner and they want this type of information, they, if they reach out to support or the PS team account member they are working with, they can get that information as well. Uh, okay. But we don't make the uh, release notes available for customers before we ship. Got it. So there's no like future roadmap that's visible to know like, all right, so there's this thing I really need, but it's not coming out till probably next year. That's a good question. So that's, I remember, okay, so I think that's something I work on. So we, we currently don't, uh, don't have our roadmap publicly available on our website. Mm-hmm. Uh, but having said that, customers, I've had a lot of one-on-one meetings. If, you customer, if you're a customer, you want to have a roadmap call with me, I will get on the call to talk to you, with you on it. And the partner, I mean, Rarick and other people know. I, I mean, we do have, uh, all my partners I do, I've, I've had most of them, I've had uh, roadmap discussions with them already. So maybe I think it would be a good idea to have a public facing roadmap in future. So that's a good feedback, but currently we don't have it on our website where you could go and see it. But again, you could always request to have a meeting through support and yeah. I'll be on a call with you to discuss and then get feedback. That, that always gives me the opportunity to get feedback about the value of it to you. And then maybe some things I've missed and then just get good feedback from you as well, so. Yeah, that's great. And along uh, the lines of the things we're saying now as well is that, you know, we do the release reviews, right? As new release is prepared, you know, a few weeks before that release becomes available, typically it's a meeting with Daniel and he's explaining everything that's in the tool to all of our partners combined, right? So that we get an understanding of what's coming and what, what to expect and, and specifically what issues it resolves. You know, that's, that's where a lot of those, those focuses are on new features and then any, um, any minor issues that, that are being resolved with that new uh, maintenance uh, update. So it is nice that we do have, the, we have the visibility in front of it. I think the next step for Daniel is, you know, to start looking at the roadmap further out and providing that as we go. Andor, did you have? Yeah, I, I kind of want to backtrack for a second. Um, when you mentioned about level setting with IT and making sure you're on the same page with them, and, and I think, you know, something that um, is is very straightforward. And it's probably it's it's um, it, if you're on the business side, you know to do it, but sometimes you you easily overlook it. Um, is uh, also aligning your roadmap with your uh, business partners. So if 
depending on how your teams are set up, if you have someone else managing your e-commerce, your web environments and things like that, make sure they know that you're, when you're planning and, and what you're planning to do with the, the update and the patch and how long it's going to take. And, and so they know what to expect from you from a support perspective, changes perspective, et cetera. Um, because I know that that can get sometimes sticky if, if you kind of just uh, pop up and say, surprise, we're doing an upgrade. Uh, you're not yeah. getting any changes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of the key as well is as you yeah. start dealing with enterprise level architecture, right? It right. no longer becomes a small group of three people that are managing all of the components. You've got completely different business teams that are involved. Like you said, you mm -hmm. might have an e-commerce group that, that's going to be affected potentially by that change. You might have the, the core ERP team that's doing it. There may be planning. There may be merchandising. There could be all these different business groups that are involved. And so we typically recommend is putting together sort of a steering committee for that, right? Where as a group, you can get together and it may not be PIM specific. It might be project specific, right? Here are the things that we want to accomplish this year um, as, a, as a collective group. We know that we want to upgrade our e-commerce engine. Okay, great. We know that in order to do that, we're going to have to take this upgrade that we need to do on the PIM tool to be able to accommodate the new business requirements for our e -com. So you can start building that roadmap and strategy and getting everyone involved early so that there's no surprises when you actually have to deploy and start doing these things. And you don't end up with the, the most dangerous piece, which is four or five projects on top of each other at the same time that are now dependent on one another that didn't plan together. And I've seen that become a resource constraint, right? And it can quickly become a resource constraint, especially if you only have, say, five IT components, you know, to people that can do the, the work within your IT department, and you've now spread them over eight projects that all need to land within a period of 90 days, right? Then you have to start picking and choosing, and you never want to be in that situation, especially when another piece of software may be dependent upon that upgrade to the, to the PIM component, right? And so that's, that's a key to always, always plan ahead, plan ahead, plan ahead, um, and, and create that roadmap and create that, that synergy between the groups, right? So that they're always speaking to each other. And then once you do that, then you have to test, you know, because we can deploy a new enhancement, but if you don't test it against your standard components that you already have set and you haven't done any work and you just decide to throw that into production, you run the risk of because every environment is unique, your environment may not work specifically the way that you're expecting it to with that component. And that's one of the great things about the Underworks platform is that you can build as many repositories as you want to. You can build as many profiles as you want to. You can build as many code sets as you want to. You can build up as many exports and imports as you want to, but you do have to manage those components, right? And if you're adding custom components and if you don't test those components when you take you know, an upgrade, then you run the risk internally of not, you know, testing that before you put it into production. So a key is start in the lower environment, always test against the standard battery of tests that you use. We typically have, I think we have like 200 different tests we run against uh, just the classic UI alone. The new UI, I think there's about 120, 130 typically that we run. And then we also have a section where we, if it was a client specific component that we knew was deployed, we test any specific functionality around that. And, and if you follow that pattern, then you know that each time you deploy, you've got a standard deployment, you've got a standard practice for how you test that. And then you can come back with any questions where you said, hey, you know, the 10.3 release, this was functioning as expected. We went to 10.4 and now I'm seeing that my export is not, isn't, isn't running the way that I want it to then that's, that gives you the ability to open up a ticket with WinShuttle or with your partner to say, this is what I'm seeing. And you have some, you have some hard, hard data against it, right? Or you know you've tested it in this environment. You know that you've tested it in this environment. You can put the two together. And it, and it makes it much easier for any um, issue resolution that we need to do as well. Okay. So another area we, we might want to talk about uh, in terms of consideration is around cost. I know there are multiple layers of cost, right? So but maybe the one I'll pick on is, for example, if when we move from eight to nine, 10, uh, there's a cost of infrastructure, right? So now you need, to, if you if, if your plan, the, your new ar distributed architecture requires more servers, or maybe now you need a, uh, maybe Azure Blob, right? Something like that. They are all costs that you need to factor in. I don't know, uh, Nando, how you think about those type of costs. Uh, that you need to consider maybe around implementation costs as well, all those stuff from, from your experience in the field. Yeah, yeah. I mean, usually that's, 
it's definitely a cost you have to consider, but it's something that you want to lay out uh, within your budget planning um, through, you know, around the end of the year, beginning of the year to ensure that you have the right funds needed to cover off um, not only uh, paying for uh, the licenses, but also any sort of maintenance or upgrade costs that might come along with it as well. So that's, that's something that, that you want to integrate into your budget and also plan for um, when, when looking at how you, how you want to handle uh, budget items for, for the system itself. And I think along that line too, Daniel, there's, there's no cost to take a maintenance um, upgrade, right? So there is no cost, physical cost there where the cost comes into play is if you are really going to a new version of the software. And then again, there may be some architectural components that need to be changed, right? Yes. So let's, let's talk about the, the, the costs that aren't necessarily a, a dollar amount up front that you would see, you know, um, so, so again, we go to the, the testing scenario, right? And the fact that you may have to bring a particular service down for a certain amount of time. How did you, how did you manage that, Nandor? How did you, how did you handle that when you were doing your deploys? Yeah, I mean, um, we, we, we probably did it the wrong way um, in some cases. Um, <laughs> But, and I mean, we did do, we did set it up. So we, we did get a sandbox environment. We had a development environment and we had a production environment. So really the sandbox environment helped us um, play out any sort of, you know, initial issues without having to shut down our main environments and add any unforeseen business costs as you were talking about, Eric, because, you know, mm -hmm. it, once you get to production, if that system goes down, then there's a downstream effect that then, starts adding up depending on how many days the system is down and you're not transmitting, you're not syndicating data out to your websites, to your e-commerce sites, to your GDSN pools and things like that. So it's, it's not a foreseen cost, but it is a cost that ends up adding up from a sales perspective. Um, but <clears throat> so one of the things that we wanted to look out for was really making sure that, okay, if we're going to go through and test this, we want to ensure that our sandbox or dev environment and our production environment are all lined up, all speaking, the same language and all look the same so that there's no surprises each and every time you uh, implement the upgrade or the patch, um, you're, you essentially know what's going to happen and what's coming your direction. Um, and so what we ended up doing actually was we, we did a production copy down. So from our production environment, we copied the system down to dev and sandbox. And then the other thing that we ended up doing was we took our um, APIs feeding data into uh, the Interworks environment and made sure that they were uh, feeding in from the production uh, API. So we had a, we had a, we were using SAP, um, we were using SAP. And so we had an SAP production environment and an SAP development environment and test environment. And so uh, for testing purposes and regular every day, we had our sandbox and dev environments hooked up to the SAP test environment. So it was only test data coming through. But uh, to ensure that it was running the same way, the right way, and how it would run within production, we actually uh, hooked up the SAP production data into our dev environment so that we had that uh, automated flow of data coming over uh, regularly and frequently so that we could test um, the automated flow. So it's not just us, you know, setting up flows coming over from the SAP environment, but it was actually the system doing it. Uh, and then also sort of stress testing it from an amount perspective as well. Um, so, so those were the things that were huge for us. Um, one of the key learnings though, um, and Daniel, you might have to correct me on this one because I always um, mess it up, but um, part of the system architecture, you, you know, making sure that you're, you're, you might be on a 10.3.1 patch for production and, and dev, but there's a, um, I can't think of the term now. Um, services but framework. Services right? framework that, that you're on the same page with that because if you're not, that can cause a lot of problems. Uh, yeah. or, that's a or, very good point yeah because from 10.4 going uh, i don't know if you go and look if i will encourage you guys to go and look at the release notes but we are now tying the services framework release version to uh, the end to it so now we've tied them together so excellent so that, yeah, and, going forward from 10 yeah so what nando is referring to is you know in 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 terms of the design there is core design which is you know the primary 10.3 release, 10.3.2, 10.3.3, you know, as, as you move through those. And then there is a services framework, which essentially runs a lot of the, the backend services that you do, all of your workflows and scheduled functionality. Um, and that, that operates under a similar framework, but it's a separate grouping. And traditionally it had been a separate grouping. So there may have been an update to the scheduled framework 
that may not have a direct effect on the on the front end core product, but it was something that needed to be updated to add maybe another uh, stored procedure or something into the system that needed to be able to run. And so one of the things you want to make sure you do is, you know, if you are on an older version, you want to make sure that you get the the most current services framework patch. It sounds like Daniel has, a, has approached that moving forward so that each time there is a maintenance update, there will be a services framework update that will be attached to it to keep the two in sync. So what that means is that, please guys, don't reach out to Brand Zapke to give you a new update because it's not allowed to do that anymore. So you will have to come through me to, to approve any updates. Oh, man, you're <laughs> killing me, Daniel. <laughs> no more emails to Brian. <laughs> Excellent. So I guess, uh, I don't know if there's any other components or, that we want to kind of uh, uh, address at this point, Tracy, Daniel. I think that we covered most of the topics that we wanted to get to. I have, I have an, a question. Mm -hmm. So um, it was submitted, it says, can you please address if migration utility functionality works irrespective of the Interworks version when we migrate objects during the upgrade? So I'm assuming they're probably referring to going from say like the eight uh, like, platform to the 10 like eight to 10. migration. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So with that one, so we um, um, by migration utility, I'm assuming they are talking about the classic UI. You have the migration, you have migrate out, migrate in, and migrate users. So that that capability was done to help people move from the two architectures, just push things out. So I don't I don't see why it should it should work for any upgrade from uh, from eight coming up. So. I think the only change that you would see from eight to 10 is, you know, obviously in the 10 version 10, we provide the, uh, the properties for the shared configuration. And the exactly. Yeah. So you will see a difference in the migrate in portion. When you migrate in your file, you'll have some additional options that pop up at the bottom for migrating actual shared configuration components. So the most common would be maybe like the background color for, for that exactly. uh, environment, or maybe a description that goes up at the top, or maybe the, the maximum number of records you'll allow someone to download uh, or the maximum file size. And, and, and the reason for that, it's actually, it's actually a very good reason because traditionally you would have had to rely on the IT team to restart all of your services and do, you know, do the dance, right, to be able to deploy that change. And what that did is that gives the business user the ability to configure some of those components that really don't require, uh, either it's not going to require IT, it does require a, a, a business user that is an admin, right, you obviously wouldn't want to give you know, anyone access to change the naming convention on your, you know, background within your environment. But, uh, but you do have those functions now readily available that you can now manage through the UI component, instead of having to go back into the server, make those changes, stop services, restart services and have them take effect. So, it, and again, it, it came out of a, a business need, right? The, the business team said, well, I want to be able to change the background. Why can't I do that? I want to be able to update this. Why can't I do this in real time? And so that function was created specifically for that. So again, that would be something new you would see in the migrate in feature, um, but it wouldn't make any changes to the way you migrate in that data if you're using the migration tool within, within the UI. All right, if there are any other additional questions, feel free to send those in now. Um, otherwise, we'll start wrapping things up. Um, if yeah. there are more Tracy, questions. I could see one question there from okay. Sri Hari uh -huh. saying, All right, Trace, can you ask this question? How to ID, to identify the last updated value at attribute level when we are using API call to fetch updated data from? Okay, this is a very technical question. So uh, what I don't know what use case, what type of attribute you're trying to get up. I mean, what you're using. So you could, you could just log, log a support call and then, uh, yeah, so it will come to us and we'll look at it. So it's a very technical thing to discuss. All right. Well, that will conclude our webinar for today. Um, David, Nandor, Eric, all of you are so full of knowledge and thank you for sharing it with us today. Um, I hope that this makes everyone a little bit more uh, informed and um, knowledgeable around upgrades, especially when it comes to the Interworks platform. Um, thank, as a thank you for 
attending this session, we're offering a complimentary one-on-one follow-up session. Um, if you're interested in this, feel free to give us an email at experts at goamplify.com, or you can respond to the email that will be coming out in the next coming days um, with your recording and the opportunity to respond for that one-to-one -one expert session. Um, be sure to keep an eye out for more Ask the Expert sessions, um, and we will continue to be your trusted resource in the MDM space. That's all from us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bert.